The Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies presents the Pearl of Great Price Lecture Series, given by Dr. Hugh Nibley. Today's lecture is entitled, Adam and Eve. Nothing can help you out so much in to answer more questions. And this fifth this this chapter of Moses is a pretty long one, too, you notice. I'm just going to go through it and, and marvel. Now, <coughs> notice it's, uh, it starts out, Adam and Eve, we're starting out with Adam and Eve have left the Garden of Eden now. Now, there is a great literature about the conditions of things under which they lived when they left it. Uh, the darkness they found themselves in them. They had been cast out into another world, into another life. Life became short and miserable, uh, and uh, Adam didn't know whether he would ever get out of it again. Uh, the light went out. When he saw the sun go down, he had no assurance the sun would ever rise again. He was utterly depressed. Well, uh, and then he comes and, uh, and receives the instruction from the angel that tells him he doesn't have to remain there. It doesn't have to be that way. But first, it is a lone and dreary world. But he, being driven out, he began to till the earth and have dominion over the beasts. Notice the distinction there. The King James Version translates that word kvash to subdue. So he said, so he has to subdue everything. It's his prerogative to go out and slaughter anything he wants to because he's the Lord and master of the earth. But it doesn't say that at all. There are people that you, my father believed that firmly. But this he was to till the earth, see, he's properly translated the word kavash, which means to hoe, to till the earth, but have dominion over the beasts. Well, dominion is lordship. To be a dominus, to be a lord, I will make you lord over all things, master over all things. Uh, I will give dominion over all things and make you lord over all things on the face of the earth. Well, to be the lord is the hot ward, the loaf ward, the keeper of the loaf, the ward. A ward is a, is a guardian, a keeper, as you know, to guard, to ward. And uh, to have dominion is the Latin word to be a dominus. Dominus is the domus, is the house. You know. The dominus is the Lord who has, is the master of the house and is responsible for all the creatures in the house. Just as the loaf ward, the loaf ward is the one to see to it that all, all family, all connections, all members of the estate, all dependents are properly cared, uh, fed and cared for. And the same with the dominus. He has charge of the, he has charge of the domus. And uh, at the end of the, of the comedy, he invites this, we get this still back in Aristophanes, he invites all the world to come and feast at his board, because as the Dominus, that's his obligation. And we think of it as, an ex, as a license to exterminate. <laughs> you're made lord of everything, you're made master, you're made uh, given dominion, you're made responsible. You till the earth. Well, without crash, you say, oh yeah, that's subdue, all right. Well, of course, you till the earth. But over the creatures you have dominion. And to eat his bread by the bread of his brow. See, he, he is the bread maker. He shares the bread with them. Bread now becomes, see, this is a very important uh, doctrine of uh, the Ebionites and other early Christian sects, that wheat is the food of fallen man. And they would not eat wheat uh, because it was forbidden. It was a, the sign of, of falling. As we say, wheat is for man in his fallen condition. A wheat is for a semi-arid area. It's to be cultivated by the sweat of the brow. It's a, it is a, a staple for man, and it's the one he must work to produce. And when he's outcast, he lives on wheat. Now, when he was in the garden, he was a fruit gatherer, and he lived uh, on the, a whatsoever tree. He must freely eat. And uh, the gathering of fruits and berries is, is a pleasant sort of thing. But this is wheat. This is an economy. This ties him down to the earth. And by the sweat of his brow, he has to live now. See, he's cast out into a, uh, in a semi-arid. Remember, uh, where he was was a lush garden. When he goes out, he has to hump just to keep alive. Remember, that's sweat of his brow. He, he's no mere figure of speech. Because he's in a land of uh, thistles, weeds, all, nox all sorts of noxious weeds, and semi-arid plants uh, that have to. You have to cultivate if you're going to get anywhere, because they are briars, thorns, weeds, as Tennyson says, wearying in a land of sand and thorns. So here is Adam. And it's not a happy life, particularly. 
And I, the Lord, commanded him, and his wife, his wife did labor with him. They used both the same words for labor, remember. He was his, his curse for that he would have to labor all the days of his life to bring forth from the earth. And exactly the same word is used for Eve. She would have to labor to bring forth offspring. Nevertheless, her life would be spared. They both have the same labor. It is not Eve is under no worse of a, no worse a curse than Adam is. Uh, he's under the same. He has to labor and all the days. And uh, so they begin to have families, and Mother Plan replenished the earth, which had been the commandment, of course. I have ordered all creatures, every form of life, may fill the measure of its existence and have joy therein, and also uh, reproduce. Mother Plan replenished the earth. And notice, <coughs> this is before we get Cain and Abel. <coughs> they begin to multiply, and you know, uh, populations multiply very fast when, they're <coughs> when there's nothing to restrain them an astonishing thing. The population of Egypt has gone up and down phenomenally. Central America, the same thing, up and down. One generation would be in eight or nine million, the next uh, in the 30s and 40s, or where they figure. Uh, my friend Woodrow Bora has done, spent his life studying population statistics in Central America. And it's amazing how rapidly, well, we find the same thing now. We find so many uh, species like the sea otter that are almost completely exterminated. And as soon as they give, are given protection, they just come back like that. You find them all over the place. It's a funny thing. Give animals half a chance, and they'll replenish the earth. So uh, they began to replenish the earth, and they divided two and two. You notice they're not practicing polygamy here. They divide two and two uh, because they're, as you know, the statistics, the birth rates are about equal for male and female and various species and so forth. So. They divide two and two in the land and to ten flocks and also beget sons and daughters. You notice Abe, uh, Adam had lived with the creatures, with the beasts and so forth, and now they are pastoral. Uh, but pastoral and, uh, and agricultural, they always go together. We used to think there was originally a pastoral phase and then they went into an agricultural phase and so forth. That's not so at all. Everything shows a, a difference today, that the two go together from the first and they go naturally. I mean. If you, well, you began first with the hunting phase and then with a, uh, with a pastoral phase and then with uh, agriculture. But you have all three together wherever you go. If you hunt the animals, you're herding them, actually. If you're, if you're following the herds, you get to know each other. There are many examples of that. You pick up the strays, the calves, and so forth. They become family pets and the likes. And you hunt, and uh, you herd at the same time. But at the same time, you get whatever kind of vegetation you need. Uh, fruits and vegetables, grains, wherever you can pick them up. And uh, they called on the name of the Lord, and they heard his voice. That's interesting. He wasn't with them anymore. They could hear his voice speaking from the garden. They saw him not, but they were shut out from his, his presence. Uh, the link was there. This is what the, what the uh, Jews called, the rabbis called, the bat kol. Uh, that was his daughter, kol. The bat kol is the echo, the voice of the, uh, the daughter of the voice. Literally, it means the daughter of the voice. If you, the prophets, they say, after the last prophets, the uh, rabbis didn't get inspiration, but they did have the bat kol. They could hear the voice. They could hear the echo. You could have inspiration, intuition, and so forth. Not face to face anymore, but the bat kol. And they didn't see, they're cut out from his presence, but they have the bat kol, they say. And he gave them the commandments. Now he gives them commandments. He gives them the law of God. He gives them the law of obedience. He gives them the law of sacrifice. He gives them the law of the gospel in this column here, which they follow. See, they're starting on the way back now. And uh, the newly discovered Coptic gospel of John, well, Apocryphon of John, there are three of them, three Johns. They will tell you how it was three messengers that were sent to instruct them. And the Vandalian literature will tell you that those letters, the messengers that came to instruct Adam and Eve were the apostles who later became the pillars of the church, Peter, James, and John. They came and instructed Adam and Eve in the garden. But here they're the sent ones. They're called the sent ones to, to instruct them here. And he gave commandments that they should worship the Lord their God and should offer firstlings. You notice the first thing is that they should worship the Lord their God. Of course, worship means worth skip to hold at highest value. Uh, means to call upon here, but to esteem above everything else him, 
and should offer the firstlings of their flocks. Notice, the sacrifice goes right with it. They're commanded to sacrifice, no explanation given yet, the firstlings of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord. And Adam was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. So there you get it. See, here's the law of God and the law of obedience. It goes with it. He was obedient. And he showed his obedience by practicing the law of sacrifice, offering the firstlings of his flocks. Uh, it doesn't mention here the first things the fields. They don't come yet. You notice why it had to be the flocks and why it had to be the animals because it was the shedding of blood. This is a similitude of the blood of the only begotten. And the shedding of blood ceased uh, the law of Moses. But uh, so here we get those three laws all bound together. The first things that bind Moses are that he should worship God and that he should be obedient by making the offering. And... Uh, then come the sent ones to teach him. After many days, he kept this up. He was true and faithful. He received no evidence until after the tri uh, testimony, until after the trial of your faith. After many days, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Adam, saying, You notice, at last we're getting that one religion, which is, remember, we had that light, dark, light business, pre-existence, existence, and hereafter, past, present, and future. We get a, a, a religion which is light all the way. It was light in the pre-existence. They're going to have light now and light hereafter, rather than darkness in all three. It's the only one we have because you, the others, conventional Christianity and Judaism, don't allow for a pre-existence. Well, after many days, so they stuck with it. Every word is significant in this chapter. An angel of the Lord appeared under Adam, saying, Why dost thou offer sacrifice? He is being tested, you see. Uh, he's not to remain in the old doldrums. You could go on doing this forever, but you don't have... The Lord doesn't play cat and mouse with you. He doesn't keep you waiting forever. Uh, give you a test with sufficient time, enough to show your integrity and so forth, and you'll get your answer. Sometimes very true. But we say, the Lord uh, keeps us waiting these things, the promises of the second coming and all that. They wait and wait and wait. I was just talking with somebody yesterday that I, I remember my great-grandfather very well, who was 22 years old when the prophet was killed. And uh, that hasn't been a long time. We haven't waited forever and ever. And look what's happened. Just take any 10 years of that period, and the history has moved at the speed of, of an express train, we used to say. The uh, things have gone very fast. The time has not been long. The things you've seen in your own life are familiar with the complete change of the world, the utter shifting of the scene in our own day. And uh, we don't realize that our memories are short to just go back a little ways and what a, what a difference the picture is. But uh, he doesn't keep him waiting too long, but after many days he appears and asks him why he does it, and he says he doesn't know. He's just fulfilling the law of obedience, that's all, by making sacrifice, uh, the first and that only law. Then the angel spake, saying, and told him what it was. The atoning sacrifice is universal. Uh, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten Father, uh, unbegotten Father, which is full of grace and truth. This is a sacrifice. And always that epithet, the only begotten, full of grace and truth. That covers absolutely everything, doesn't it? Grace, nothing negative, nothing bad, nothing against, no, no self-interest, no aspirations, no competitive spirit, nothing. It's pure grace, pure love and truth. Nothing faked about it. Uh, no special effects here. No tricks. Nothing held back at all. It's the real thing all over. He is full of grace and truth. Wherefore, um, thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the Son, and thou shalt repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. Uh, this perpetual repentance is a very interesting thing. Of course, we do that all the time. Uh, if we repent, we can only call upon the God right, uh, correctly if we repent. We must repent and call upon him forevermore. You can see why. Repent means putting yourself, putting yourself in a condition of repentance, of recognition of your, your unworthiness and so forth. How long are you unworthy? How long do you need to repent? We're told. Until you are full of grace and truth. When you are full of grace, and full, you notice all these words, when you are full of grace and truth, then maybe you might not need to repent anymore. But I think that's quite a while before any of us will be full of grace and truth. 
and one person needs it just as badly as the other. The, uh, and in that day, um, if we repent, see, we are approaching him honestly. If we don't, we are not approaching him honestly. If we think we're adequate, if we think we're adequate in asking him for these things, then uh, it's going to be rather shallow. We're, fool we're deceiving ourselves, and he is not to be deceived. He is full of grace and truth. If you repent, you have to get yourself into the mood for that. Well, wherefore thou shalt do all that thou doest. You notice all these words are magnificent. This, this phrase here, I mean, uh, <laughs> of Edward Meyer, who spoke very broken English in the, in the German school, who said we have to reject these writings of Joseph. Said they're very wonderful, but they're written in such crude, primitive English that these people must have been an uneducated lot. And it's typical frontier hysteria, that sort of thing. Yes, Edward Meyer. <laughs> And, of course, the, the English is, is perfect here, because it says exactly what it wants to. Wherefore, thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the Son, and thou shalt repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. Who do we call on when we pray? One person and one person only. We call upon God. But always in the name of the Son. This puts us into the picture. Everybody gets into the act. That is God's desire. Uh, we didn't emphasize enough those two verses, 38 and 39, at the end of the first Moses there, where he says, and there is no man to his works or his words, and this is his work and his glory to bring about the eternal life and immortality of man. It is to spread it around, to share the glory. Glory is shared intelligence, and it's to be shared here, and here's the way we get in on it. Repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. Now, you see, we're going to get to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Uh, we're told, if he yields to temptation, uh, we will send a sacrifice for him. And this is provided. This is explained here. And in that day, the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam, which beareth record of the Father and the Son, saying, I am the only begotten. You notice the Holy Ghost says, I am the only begotten. Well, he's bearing record. That's his business, to bear record of the Father and the Son and the Son from the beginning. Henceforth and forever, as thou hast fallen, thou mayest be redeemed here. What did we have in, oh, this is four and four here. Um, and all mankind will be redeemed, but not automatically, even as many as will. Because if you don't want to, it's against your will. In the fourth uh, uh, verse of the fourth chapter here, he tells us, you see the he became Satan, the devil, even the father of all lies, to deceive and blind men and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. If you want to hearken, if you want to leave, follow someone else, that's your prerogative. We have the law of free agency here, and that's what it's being tested for, after all. Henceforth thou hast fallen, thou mayest be redeemed, and all mankind, as many as will. They ha he has fallen, <coughs> but can be redeemed. Of course, this is the good news. This is the gospel. Remember, we have Adam fallen here, as Moses was in the first chapter, down, hopeless, out, and so forth. But the good news is that it doesn't have to end here. You can go back again. And we turn again to the presence, to our presence, and with us partake of eternal life and exaltation. And this is the, which we call the gospel. Of course, everyone get in the good news. And in that day, notice how they rejoice at the good news which they received. And in that day Adam blessed God and was filled and began to prophesy concerning all the families of God. Uh, how can you bless God? Does he need blessing? Does he ask you for a blessing and so forth? Well, a blessing, you, a blessing can go in both ways, you see. A blessing is approval, is a full approval and full acceptance of another. Well, lots of people don't accept God. They don't approve of God all the way or they would accept him. You bless... Uh, of course, bless has a double, a double etymology. One says it's from blotsam, the old English word blotsam, and connect with our word blood, to make a blood sacrifice, to bless in that sense. But blessing is also connected with the word bliss, uh, bliss approval, a complete, uh, there's the eschatology of bliss, the eschatology of woe, a complete approval, a complete acceptance when you bless God. So people can bless each other, you see. Uh, you can bless your father, your mother, as well as they can bless you. And he blessed God and uh, was filled and began to prophesy concerning all the families of the earth. And he's the father saying, Blessed be the name of God, for because of my transgression, my eyes were open. Now, the, uh, 
Okay, to my yeah. Well, what were his eyes open to? All sorts. Of, they haven't eaten. The, they they've eaten the fruit already, and their eyes were open. You know, we told them that they became. But the Old Testament calls fakiach. Fakiach. Fakiach is a person whose eyes is o- are open, and he sees things that other people don't see. Laman and Lemuel accused their father of being a visionary man, and that's the way it's nearly always rendered in the Bible. A visionary man is a fakiach, like the attendants of Elisha. Uh, who see the horses there when other people can't see them and so forth. But here you see things that really are there and others can't see them. There is such a condition. Uh, but this is not what he refers to. See, when they ate the fruit and they became pakia, their eyes were open. They saw themselves in a different world. They saw things they'd never seen before. They were in a totally different uh, ambience. And here, his eyes are open. And because of his transgression, his eyes are open to his vulnerability. His eyes are open to his condition now. He knew he was in a bad condition, but his eyes were open to the real situation. There's a whole series of eye openings here. Uh, things, Moses, now I know that man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. He had come down to this earth now, and his eyes were open, and he realized how low he could get, and that had never occurred to him. His eyes were opened again. And then it says, he lifted up his eyes again, and again he saw God on his throne. So we see different things that are there that aren't now because of my transgression, my eyes are open, my land. Just uh, 10 years ago, they would say it was absolutely impossible to create such a thing as a hologram. It's absurd. You can't have it. I showed you that thing in the National Geographic <coughs> one I had you on the last time. And this was a hologram. You could see a thing be right around this skull uh, very nicely. Well, that's impossible on the two-dimensional surface. You can't do that. But you can do it. See, when you go into some new phase, your eyes are open, so be... Be ready for all sorts of surprises. And now here is the gospel. In this life I shall have joy, and again in the flesh I shall see God. And there's a joke here. So in this life he has joy as well as in the others. It's like usually darkness. And Eve, his wife, heard all these things. Now she's in on it with everything, of course. All these things and was glad, saying, were it not for our transgressions, remember, she's the one who points out it is better that we should fall in sorrow and so forth. She points that out in the temple. Uh, we should never have seen, we should never have known good and evil and the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God hath given unto all the obedient chapters. It's the law of obedience that is established here. So this is the gospel. This is the good news that you do not have to take a beating all the time. In this life you can have joy, and that no matter what happens, you can be happy about it, because it's, it's all perfectly lovely and everything is all right. Uh, Adam, bless the name of God, they are completely happy, it's blissful. Bless the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. They began to preach the gospel right then and there, and it doesn't take. Immediately, Satan strikes back again, here we go. He comes among them saying, very insolently, why... Why should a mere statement such as that, as I am also a son of God, believe it not? And they believed it not, just like that. Uh, and then began from that time forth to be sensual, carnal, sensual, and devilish. You remember, many people have protested to the Calvinistic doctrine that uh, men are by nature carnal, sensual, and devilish. And, exa- and we are, we don't know plenty of that. But it was from that time on when they began to love Satan more than God. They began to take that way. Then you get, then you get carnal, sensual, and devilish. Uh, yes? With that um, phrase that the, um, the Colossians all the before, if man falls, then we will provide him. Oh, yes. And then later on, as you mentioned in the Tempest Day and everything, when... Yes, then he may again return to our then, presence. Right, yeah. This is the only way. No, that's what he's talking about here. Now, do you feel that that is true, or, is there, or are those just... Well, what other way would you suggest? I don't know, I'm asking you. You're the teacher. There isn't any. Okay. Just one. <laughs> well, that's opinion, I see. But, uh, no, this just really develops into something now. While well, Satan comes among them, see. We see him, his insolence, he uh, comes to Moses and gets turned aside there. He doesn't get very far. But I am also a son of God. Notice that is his appeal, that he is a son of God. Satan never speaks against God in this this book. Never. I've said nothing about Father. He's all for the gospel. He's all for saving people. In the council in heaven, he wanted them saved too. And he wanted to do the saving. (coughs) Uh, 
there are lots of people that way that want to do the right thing as long as, as they're in charge. <laughs> but if they're not in charge, all government is then just an evil. And they're in charge, they run everything. Well, Satan came among them saying, I am also a son of God. He doesn't say, I'm the devil and I'm against God, you better join me. And he commands them. Remember when he appeared, the first, his first uh, step is to make a command, speak out right. He wants to be worshipped, that's what he wanted in the first place, give me that honor. So he commands them, as he commanded Moses, saying, worship me. That's what he commanded Moses to do. Uh, well, excuse me, saying, believe it not. And so they believed it not, and they loved Satan more than God. Now you know lots of cases of people uh, who've, had that, who've had that reaction. Somebody comes along and says, don't believe it, so they don't believe it. I know lots of that happened. All, all it took was some, somebody to say, because they want that to happen, they're triggered to receive that because of the amount of discipline that's required if you accept it, remember? After many days, an angel of the Lord appeared, why do you obey? He's following the law of obedience. Well, that's a strenuous thing. It requires some concentration. We can't keep a, we can't keep a celestial order on earth without working at it all the time. And it's strenuous. And in fourth Nephi, you see how the people got tired of it. It was just, just not worth the trouble. It was easier going back to the old way. And, uh, becoming competitive and teaching their children to hold the Lamanite children in contempt and so forth. And this was the easy thing to do. And so people are just waiting right now, this salamander business, for the silliest, for the silliest pretext, you see. People will leave the church, which means they were just waiting for something uh, to, give it to give them a good reason, that they thought was a good reason. Well, all he had to do was say, believe it or not, and they didn't believe it. And they loved Satan more than God, uh, but you notice we are not necessarily carnal and sensual and devilish. You become that way if you start acting that way. And began from that from that time forth <coughs> to be carnal and sensual and devilish. Well, then the reaction, of course, is the, the two ways, the doctrine of the two ways. The Lord God called upon them by the Holy Ghost everywhere and commanded them that they should repent. There's the rub, too, who wants to be told to repent. You're not going to get votes by telling people to repent, but by telling them that, that everything is wonderful. And as many as believed in the Son and repented of their sins should be saved. Many believed not, repented not, should be damned. And the words went forth out of the mouth of God as a firm decree, and they must be, wherefore they must be fulfilled. This is the law that sent the, the doctrine of the two ways. We got it way back in the Shabako stone, way back in the beginning there. Adam and Eve keep at it now. Now, incidentally, this, uh, at verse 16 here, you begin chapter 4 in Genesis that follows along, but there are quite a few additions here. They ceased not to call upon God, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and conceived and bare something. Now she bears Cain after all this that's been going on. Now Cain is born. And you can see the logic of that enigmatic statement in the Bible that says, where she says, uh, I have uh, begotten a man from the Lord, and so forth. And you think of Cain as a very blessed and special person. And they thought he was. They expected great things of him. They expected that he would turn the tide. Everything had gone against Adam and Eve here. People were not repenting or anything else. And uh, many of them were. They continued. And when they begot Cain, they said, I have begotten, Eve said, I have begotten a man of the Lord, wherefore he may not reject his words. There was hope that Cain would be the right one. He wouldn't reject the words. He would put things back on the track, but he didn't. He was a failure. But behold, Cain hearkened not and not, saying, Who is the Lord that I should know him? Just like Korah, or just like the sophist, as we said ago, Who is the Lord that I should know him? Uh, the, uh, so the hopes for Cain were blasted. Now you're going to get the two brothers, and this is a very common thing. You know, it's out the Old Testament, Jacob and Esau, and so forth. Uh, Joseph and his brethren, and... Uh, uh, the twins, uh, Rendell Harris wrote an important book on this uh, in, in ancient law and ancient religion, the rivalry between the two twins. And it's always the younger, younger twin, imagine, second born, it's always the younger who receives the kingdom instead of the older. Is the younger is declared the firstborn in the Shabako stone. Remember, it was Horus, not Seth, but Horus, was declared to be the firstborn in the opening of the womb. As a matter of fact, it's a technicality. You see, Jacob was not younger than Esau at all. Remember, Jacob was a clever little guy. He was always doing clever tricks. But he held a firm grip onto Esau's heel when they were born. 
so that there were no, not two deliveries. The womb was not opened twice. Esau came out, and Jacob came out right with him. He didn't let go of that heel. He was hanging on. That's where he got the name Jacob, uh, the little rascal. And he was always, I say, he was always doing tricks like that. So you really can't say that he was second born because a birth is, uh, is an opening of the womb. Uh, this is the Egyptian term for it, you see. Uh, wept yet, the opening of the womb, the opening of the... Of the uh, and so to say that uh, Horace was an opening of the womb, well, he did too. Right along with that technical point, right? to be baited by the doctors for weeks. Pteris and Galbungus dedicated for uh, 14 days and 14 nights on the subject of whether ego, on an ego has a talkative case or not. Well, <clears throat> and then she conceived again, and Abel. And Abel hearkened unto the voice of the Lord, and Abel was the keeper, and so forth. Now Cain loved, now we come to the epic of Cain. Cain is a very important person, because we talk about the problem of evil in the world, and uh, this tells us a lot of the story. He loved Satan more than God. Uh, and Satan commanded him, saying, Make an offering unto the Lord. Now, Satan is counterfeiting the ordinance, is all the truth. And notice again, he says, Make an offering unto the Lord. He doesn't say, Make an offering unto me, or make an offering unto devils. He says, Make an offering unto the Lord. He claims to be running the gospel on earth. He claims to be running the church, as far as that goes. And, uh, or he said before, And a command again. Commands him to make an offering to the Lord. And there's a trick behind this. Of course there is. And in the process of time, it went on. They practiced this. In the process of time means this took some time. It just didn't happen all one day. It may be a drama, but uh, it represents a long passage of time. And uh, Cain brought fruit of the ground as an offering unto the Lord. Well, that's fair enough. First fruits go along with the first things of the flock. Uh, what was wrong with that? Abel also <coughs> brought the first things of his flock and the fat thereof, as commanded in Leviticus, of course, Deuteronomy, to offer the fat, which was considered the best. And the Lord had respect unto Abel's offering, but to a Cain, and to his offering he had not respect. Well, why not? Well, of course he couldn't. Why was Cain making the offering? Because Satan had commanded him to. He wasn't because he loved the Lord. He says he loved Satan more than God, so when Satan told him to do something, he obeyed Satan. He wasn't doing it for the Lord's benefit or as, an, as respect to the Lord, but receiving a command from Satan, he made the offering to the Lord. Would the Lord accept it under those circumstances? He receives only offerings that are made to him at his command, as, as Adam gave them. Adam followed the law of obedience. Satan is being obedient to them, but not following the law of God. He's following the law of Satan. He's not following the law of God and his obedience. He's, obedient, he's being obedient to Satan because he loves him more than God. So each trait is important here. That 18th verse, because he loved Satan more than God, when Satan commanded him to do something, he did it, even though it was making an offering to the Lord, whom he liked much less. And Abel's, of course, was accepted. Now, Satan had planned it the whole way. He knew that Cain could, that the Lord could not receive and would not receive this offering that Cain made. And he knew that Making the offering unto the Lord would have that exact effect. See, it was a devilish thing for him to do. He's getting Cain in very deeply now. He, he commanded him to make the only offering which he knew could not be accepted, and so Cain's going to be furious now. Why is my offering not accepted and Abel's is accepted? The way that we could justify themselves. And uh, he had no respect. He had no respect for the offering that... Uh, Cain brought. Well, we saw, we always heard Cain had rejected him. He said, who's the Lord that I should worship him? He refuses to worship the Lord. He only brings him the offering, as I say, because Satan told him to. The sacrifice is not his idea. Satan put him up to it. And Satan knew this all along, and it pleased him. This is exactly as he had planned it to happen. And Cain was very wroth. Notice he's Mephistopheles. He's a good Mephisto here, isn't he? Mm -hmm. The whole thing is going to end up in good. And, of course, Cain was furious, because Cain is one of these touchy people. He, he's proud in his vanity. And his countenance fell, and the Lord said to him, Well, what's the matter? Why are you rough? Now, the Lord counsels him and speaks with him very kindly, very gently, with much long-suffering, you'll notice. 
Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you so, why are you so upset? And uh, if you do well, you'll be as much accepted as Abel or anyone else, as he says here. If you do well, thou shalt be accepted. Uh, in, the Bible, in the Old Testament, it is, now, King James, if thou dost well, wilt thou not be accepted? He puts it to him as a rhetorical question. You'll be accepted if you do all right, won't you? Uh, sa'at being the word to accept. <coughs> accept as to be. But if you do not well, then he doesn't say, now you'll be damned on the spot and wiped out because you didn't do right. But he says, you're running a risk. You're at risk if you start doing that sort of thing. Sin lies at the door. Uh, it's not far away. If, if you're going to keep up with this sort of thing, you're in real trouble. Uh, Satan desires to happy. Don't you understand this? It's just a trick of Satan. He wants to trap you here. Satan desires to happy. And the only way to escape is to follow my command, not his command. And except thou heart shall hearken unto my command, then what? I'll let him have his way. You have your agency. I will deliver thee up, and it shall be unto thee according to his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, this is it again, you see, where he tells us uh, in uh, it's 4 and 1, where he says, I think it's 4 and 4, yes. And in 4 and 4, he became Satan, the devil, the father of all lies, all tricks, you see, to deceive and to bind men, blind men, and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken to my voice. You hearken to God's voice, or you, you are in his power. All who do not live up to their covenants will be in my power. That's the provision that's been made. You have the one choice or the other. And here, but then this remarkable statement. I remember Faust and the, the others. Thou shalt rule over him. What was the deal that Faust made with the devil? The famous pact with the devil. Satan said, I will serve you and give you anything you want while you are on this earth. But after that, then you serve me after that. But as long as as their, their pact their endures for this earth, thou shalt rule over him. Cain will have power over Satan. Satan will serve him and do anything he wants as long as he's here. But after that, look out. Uh, <clears throat> and this is what will happen. And this, so this becomes a stock figure, Cain, the pact with the devil, the Jabez Stone, you mentioned those others and so forth. Uh, not Rachel Lindsay, but uh, what's his name's play? Ed, Ed, uh, Vincent... Uh, and the St. Vincent and I get him very familiar with. Uh, the, uh, you know, his name is Reed. But you all know the story of the devil and Daniel Webster. You mentioned that before. Uh, well, the same thing. He makes the pact. Old Scratch will give him anything he wants, and so he makes him rich. And what Satan offers Cain here is money. You can have anything in this world for money, you see. That will see you through and get anything you want. So we'll see why how he persuades Cain to follow him. Uh, Moses, as we saw, and Adam rejected the project, but Cain accepts it. Now, <clears throat> this time forth, thou shalt be the father of his lies. He, you're going to cultivate lies and deceptions. Remember, he's a, a liar from the beginning. The whole thing is fake. He is claiming that this is the gospel. He's claiming that this is salvation, that this will give you happiness, satisfaction, and everything, and it's all phony. Thou shalt be called perdition. Now, perdition means loss. It means losing something that you had. It means one fallen from high estate and so forth. You can't be perdition. You can't be lost unless you were found. And you can't be low unless you uh, fallen unless you were high, fallen from high estate. Jared and so forth. Perditio means that is lost, lost, lost. Nine days, as Milton says, he fell in hideous ruin and combustion down, 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 down. But you have to be high because he, he was the highest in heaven up there. And down he fell. And that means perdition, the one who is lost and fallen and gone. Too bad. For thou wast also before the world. Here is, refers back to the time in the Council of Heaven and Glory when you're not going to say you brought me into this world and then put me into this terrible jam and I had nothing to say about it. Oh no, you were in the pre-existence too. And you were high up there because you're perdition now because thou also wast before the world. You had your, your pre-existence and your chance and all the rest of it. He has his anamnesis too, as, as Plato would say. And it shall be said in time to come, 
And this is the theme. You see that all these thing, evils that come in the world really go back to Cain and follow in a single tradition. <coughs> that from these abominations were from Cain, for he rejected the greater counsel which was had from God. What happens here with the two? Remember, the two plans were put forward, and he projected, he rejected God's counsel, God's plan. And this is a cursing which I will put upon thee, but it's still not too late, except thou repent. It's the gospel of repentance. And as long as you're in this earth, you can still repent. And there, as long as you're in this earth, there's no one who doesn't need to repent. And as long as you're here, it's not too late to repent. So the door is open to everyone here. And we mustn't judge people and divide them into the good guys and the bad guys. The, as Jeremiah says in chapter 18, of Ezekiel rather, it's never too late. However wicked the bad guys have been all their days, they can still repent and become the righteous. And however righteous the good guys have been all their days, they can still fall and become the wicked. The door is open right to the end. Never, never claim that you have reached, that you're saved. No one is saved here, beyond sad, beyond sin, you see. And again, no one is damned. You're not damned on this earth. You're damned in the judgment and hereafter. And you're not saved on this earth. You're in between and you're being tested. Therefore, this life became as Nephi says, a time of probation. <clears throat> so except you repent, but it's still not too late. So what did Cain do? The Lord is protesting kindly, giving him the situation very clearly, and Cain turns on his heel and stomps out in wrath. That's his character, you see. Pride was the first thing. Cain was wroth, and he listened not anyway. I'm not going to listen to any more of this, he says. It's, it's hit him right. It, it's getting through to him, and he won't stand it. So it's his choice, so... I say, he turns around and stalks out of it. And listen not any more to the voice of the Lord. Can you imagine walking out on God himself? Yeah, that would be something. Neither to Abel, his brother. Obviously, Abel, his brother, protested and had been, they had talked together a lot and uh, discussed the gospel. Who walked in holiness to the Lord. He wouldn't listen to Abel. He wouldn't listen to uh, the Lord himself. And all Adam and his wife could do, what do you do when your children act that way? Well, all Adam and his wife could do was to mourn before the Lord because of Cain and his brethren. He was followed with the other. Remember, uh, Eve said, now so we'll have someone who will turn the tide. He will be obedient and so forth. We've gotten the man to the Lord, but he didn't. And the wicked continued wicked. And it came to pass, well, and uh, <clears throat> he mourned before the Lord and he walked out with his brethren. And all I could do was mourn about it. Adam didn't really know what was going on, but Cain is very careful to make sure that he doesn't find out what's going on. Brother Craig? What, what made her think that uh, Cain was of the Lord? Was there well, that was a whole... Part? Well, he was a glorious person. It was, it was uh, like Satan himself. Uh, Cain was a... Why he would be special among all the others. We don't know, but it was his... Uh, the name is very interesting. You, know, you may mention the name in a minute, but uh, Cain said unto the Lord... Uh, she was, he was very special, and Abel was very special. It's, it's a new, again, we get, remember, we get these periods, these acts, these scenes. This opens a new scene, in other words. Cain and Abel, two new people enter on this scene that weren't there before. Okay. I'll tell you what they mean. Well, uh, Cain is a, is a very rich and significant, it'll come right out now. We'll even have time to talk about Cain. Abel uh, is usually taken to mean in mourning, uh, the lost opportunity. Hava means, means a mourning. Uh, because, of course, he was the one who was sacrificed. <coughs> now Cain gets busy on him. They, he gets married and wives and brothers, and they form their coalitions, their cliques, and they all think alike in this. And uh, he took one, one of his brother's daughters to wife. It was not Abel's. We always say, well, it must have been Abel's uh, sister or something like that, one of his sisters. Because you notice brothers are correctly plural here, plural genesis possessive here. He had more than one brother, and he took one of his brother's wives, one of his many brother's wives, uh, to wife, and they loved Satan more than God. So here we have it going. Now Satan's going to organize this thing and get it going. He's going to put it under control and make it effective. He's going to take over the world. He says to Cain, again, remember, he's been imitating everything, the gospel all the way through, and perverting it all the way through the gospel. Everything is done in the name of God and salvation and everything else. His plan and religion, and I will save them all. And now it is the mockery, of course, of the, of the ordinances of the endowment that she takes him to. But it's mockery and it's reversed. Swear unto me by thy throat, and if thou tellest, thou shalt die. Uh, 
and swear by thy brethren, by their heads, and by the living God. Notice again, who do they swear by? By the living God. They don't swear by anybody else. The same that. Uh, by, and by the living God, that they tell it not, maintain your secrecy, you see. For if they tell it, they shall surely die. And this, that thy father may not know it. He doesn't want Adam to know about this, because Adam, of course, is the head of the church. Adam is the one in charge of the ordinances and all the rest. He doesn't want Adam to know what he's been faking and what he's been doing here. The, um, thou must not know that the ordinances have been perverted. He put a stop to it, I'm sure. And this that thy father, Adam, may not know it. You do this, and this day I will deliver thy brother Abel into thy hand. So the arrangements are all made here. And notice we told back here in verse 23, thou shalt rule over him. Cain rules over Satan for this life, not the other way around. And sure enough, in the 30th verse here, Satan swear unto Cain that he would do according to his command. So Satan swears to obey Cain here, to do anything Cain wants. Anything you want, that's the famous pact with the devil. You see, you can have it all, uh, and I'll see that you get it. And I'll tell you how to get it now, he says. And all these things were done in secret, well, you can be sure of that. And Satan and Cain said, Truly I am Mahan, the master of this great secret. There's a very interesting etymology here, because the word secret, sirra, of course, in Arabic, the, the, uh, uh, the eighth form of the word, mastira, mastira, means to hold a secret, to keep a secret. And, of course, it's the same word as safra, the Greek word safra for, for secrets. Seshet, the Egyptian word is, is seshet. The seshet is to hold a secret, mashta. And uh, satar uh, is the Hebrew word for, for keeping a secret, uh, the master of a secret. So this may be, this word master may not be our word master at all, but master means keeper of secret, and maha means great. In any language, maha means great. Of course, in Arabic, English, Greek, uh, Sanskrit, or anything, maha is our word magnus, magnus, mighty, may, might. And uh, Greek, uh, magnus, uh, Latin, magnus, Greek, megas, and so forth. You get it in your maha, maharaja, anything that's big is maha. And so uh, this could mean in that way, Master Maha, the great secret keeper, could be just a suggestion here. And uh, he was, uh, so he got the master's degree, the master of this great secret, and this was the secret, <coughs> that of converting life into property. You can do it. All great acquisitions of property and gain are based on the taking of life, even in other life. You, know, you can't escape it, make a list of it as far as that goes. Uh, wherefore, Cain was called Master Mahan, and he gloried in his wickedness. The... Uh, all great, as I say, all great enterprises are going to imply, uh, put life at risk and take it. Well, now he goes into the field and talks to his brother Abel. They talked often about this and so forth. And uh, <coughs> while they were there in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now, this was the usual story, you know, is that uh, a couple of adolescents and one in a fit of peak bashes the other over the head. And that's the, the conventional story. A debate among the fathers of the church. Some say they were uh, something like uh, 13 or 15 years old. Others say uh, 20 and 25, things like that. But here they were not only grown men, but Cain knew exactly what he was doing. He'd been plotting and scheming all along, and we're told in Doctrine, uh, well, in 550 here, in the 50th verse of this chapter, uh, <coughs> Cain slew his brother Abel for the sake of getting gain. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, we're told, that he slew him by a conspiracy. He'd been conspiring and planning it for a long time. And of course, excuse me, it was deception. He overwhelmed him here. And he was not ashamed at all. He gloried in what he has done, saying, I am free, surely the flocks of my brother followeth into my hand. Huh? Satan promised Cain uh, what he had promised Adam before. You can have anything in this world for money. Of course, the world for money is, in those days, they didn't have money, but, well, money actually goes back to geese here. But the words for money we have here are, remember, it was his cattle. Surely his flocks fall into my hands, and flocks, I'll call it this way to spare trouble, see the time is short, so they X in this stage. Flocks are, uh, as you know, fee, our word fee, 
Old English fell, which is German fee, in cattle, of course, of all kinds, and also the Arabic word for, well, it means flocks, you see, flocks also. And uh, the Arabic word for flocks is uh, ganam, which is our word game. That's where we get our word game from. Game means flocks, flocks of sheep, usually of sheep, ganam. Ghani is to be rich, you know, Ghana, the land, the uh, name of the land, Ghana, Ghana means rich land. Ghaniun is a, a rich person, plural, Akhnyau is rich. So Ghana means game, means, simply means flocks fee, because that's the way you measured it. They, they still do in Africa. It devastates the country, we're told now. Or fee, fee, flocks fee. It's the, uh, what he's after was his wealth, you see. And so he says, his flocks fall into my hands, and the Lord asked him, where are your brother ba Gable? And he says, I'm not my brother's keeper. But as I say, we're told again here, he had it all planned out, and it was a conspiracy, and it was worked out, and he got what Satan had promised him, power and gain, and he's on the way to success in this world. And we have to see what happens, because Cain then becomes the object of, is a real epic figure, of course a tragic figure, but a figure of real stature. <laughs>